Welcome to the Trinity Bible College and Graduate School Chapel Podcast. Amen. Why don't we just stay in that place for a moment, students? Stay in that place. I was reading this morning in Psalms 46, and I believe it's the famous verse 11 that we all know and love, and it says, Be still and know. Be still and know. And oftentimes, I think we approach that verse from the opposite side. We say, if I can know, then I'll be still. But God says, no, I need you to be still so you can know. With the various things we have going on in our day, our weeks, our lives, the stillness of God is where his beauty resides. Because it's in the stillness that you're mindful that he is with you. It's in the stillness that you're reminded of the attributes of who he is. So therefore, whatever situation you're going through, you know he has the antidote. It's in the stillness that you center yourself and you begin to breathe again and you stop and you get away from the pressure and the burden and the anxiety and the fear and you just say, he's still on the throne. And what enables us to be still? It's that belief that he can, that he will, but most importantly, that he is. And I want to encourage somebody this morning. I don't know what your situation is, but you need to know that God can, God will, and God is. So, Lord, we just thank you right now for what you're doing and what you've started in this atmosphere. And we, as we gather here with uh, students and faculty this homecoming week at chapel, Lord. Today we don't need a sermon. We don't need just another chapel service. We need a clear picture of who you are, Jesus. We need to see your face, Jesus. Because the writers of Hebrews told us that we could look to you, that you're the author and you're the finisher of our faith. A generation cries today, we want to see you, Jesus. I don't need religion. I don't need just theology. I don't need just academics. I don't need just emotional appeal. I need to see Jesus. I don't need no more facades. I I don't need nobody, nobody to paint it for me and try to make it elaborate. I just need to see him. Because that same writer said, And it's when we look to him that we also see that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Oh, Abraham's down there somewhere saying, hey, keep going. Don't quit. David's down there saying, I know I've been there. Don't stop. Nehemiah's saying, "Uh uh-huh, I know what that feels like. And as with those great clouds of witnesses that were reminded that, listen, the God that we serve has already ran this race and he's already won. So, Lord, we thank you for what you've started today. And we stand in expectation for what you're going to do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Y'all give it up for this worship team, man. Amen. Well, good morning. How you all doing this morning? Good. Everyone get some sleep last night? Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Well, hey, I, uh, this morning I want to have some family time before tonight. Uh, we're going to party and all that good stuff. But um, today I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading from Mark, Mark chapter 9. I'm going to read the, the 11 verses there, Mark chapter 9, if you have your Bibles with you today. 
and recently I've been just studying in the, in the Synoptic Gospels the story called the uh, trans, Transfiguration. It was a story of, of Jesus and his disciples. He took three of his disciples and he, he went up on a mountain. And he went up for a purpose. Because they were about to face some things. They were about to see some things that didn't look like what they believed. They were about to experience some conditions that may have weakened their faith. And Jesus said, listen, I need you to get a clear glimpse of who I am. Because not if, but when the cross comes, I need you to be reminded that I've overcome. And I've been reading that this morning out of my devotion, and I want to go there uh, today with you all. <clears throat> I love traveling. One of the things I love doing in the airport is people watching. I got my wife with me this week. My wife is still getting in ministry straight. Um, she finally respects what I do. I said, uh-huh. You didn't think I worked, did you? Yeah. All right now. Um, one of the things I love to do is travel, and I love to uh, people watch and any moms in the house? We got any moms in the house? Moms, give yourself a round of applause. Um, I don't know how you do it, yeah, but God bless you. I saw this mom the other day in the airport. She was by herself. She had three children. I said, my God. And, uh, and they were all little. And there was one that she was, she was pushing. Uh, she was pushing in the stroller. There was one that was like kind of trailing behind her. Um, and then there was one that just he couldn't quite get it together. You know, he had ADD, and he was just everywhere and doing everything. And I remember watching that mom, and I'm like, how in the world does she do this? You ever got stressed just watching somebody else? Like, oh, gee, oh, oh, oh. And, I, and I'm watching her, and I'm like, wow. But then in a moment's notice, when it was a time for haste, I watched this mom, this little frail lady. She grabbed the baby. She pushed the stroller, and she had the one kid on her hip. And I watched her run through the airport. And I'm like, my goodness, that's amazing. And so I see her at the gate. I said, I just, you know, hey, ma'am, I, I, that's, that's amazing. She goes, no, it's called motherhood. I'm like, okay. I, mean, yeah. I, said, um, I said, do you always, I said, do you always travel this way? Um, she said, no, we just needed to this time because uh, my little ones, we just couldn't quite get it together. So I needed to uh, take them all with me. And uh, we're going on a trip. Um, they were meeting their father. And I thought it was unique because when we think of this text in Mark chapter 9, oftentimes when people think of the disciples that Jesus chose, oftentimes we can naturally think, well, Jesus had favoritism. And why, why, why did he only take these certain disciples but one thing the Lord revealed to me is sometimes it's not about favoritism. Sometimes God brings those close to him who need it the most. Those who he knows faith needs to be strengthened. And that's my prayer for us today, students. That's my prayer for myself is that God would bring us close. And so as we look through Mark 9, I'm really just going to exegete this text and paint a picture of who Jesus is. Because I was telling uh, some friends earlier. When I understood who he was, things began to change. Things got a lot easier. And what I want to talk about today is the glory of God. Anybody ever heard the glory of God? And oftentimes, I don't know if you're like me, I grew up in church, and we say, we say all kind of Christian words, and hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, brother. It's all for his glory. You know what I did? I'm like, I'm like 29 years old. I said, what is the glory? <laughs> what is it? But through some study, a simple de a definition for the glory, rather, is the beauty of God in any and all situations. The beauty of God in any and all situations. And thinking about that and thinking about some of the talks I had uh, yesterday in, in some of the freshman seminar classes, sometimes the situation is hard because I just don't see the glory of God in the situation. But as we begin to see the glory of God, we begin to see the beauty of who he is. And when we see the beauty of who he is, it gives us confidence for any and everything that we face. So let's look through this together. And I want to break this down into three components of the glory that we get to see through this text. 
And I just want to spend some time saying, Jesus, we need more of your glory. If you look in Mark chapter 9, I'm going to start in verse 1. The Bible says this, Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up the high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance uh, was transformed. And his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Here's what we have. We have Peter, James, and John. This is around the time that Christ knows that he is about to be crucified. And so he knows that I need to make a statement in these disciples' lives. Because if they see me crucified and they don't have a clear glimpse of who I am, they just may lose faith. And if I can be honest with you, students and faculty today, I've been in some situations in life where it feels like all I see is the cross, God, but I I don't don't know if I have the faith. But what, 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 what sustains you in that place? It's the glory of God. And looking in this text, There's a few things that are accident within the glory. You see what happened when Jesus transfigured? No, a light didn't shine on Jesus and he was projected. Here's the crazy thing. A light came out of Jesus. Watch this. He's God. It didn't have to come on him. It came out of him. Here's something else you need to understand about this, students. It was a lot easier for Jesus to transfigure than it was for him to make himself man. But there comes a point in time where it's like, we need a clear picture of who Jesus is. Because oftentimes, if we don't, I think we can naturally think that Jesus is just God's second best option and not God himself. So there was glory. The first part of that glory was the glory in Christ's sinlessness. The glory in his sinlessness. Watch this. It says that six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and led him up to the high mountain. And the men watched Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far wider than any earthly bleach could ever make them. The beauty of God's sinlessness. One of the attributes I love most about Jesus is the price he paid for our sin. The price, the beauty, the purity of who he is. And why is that important? Because there are a lot of situations, my friends, in life that are difficult. There are a lot of situations that are challenging. There are a lot of situations that are trying. But you also need to know that we serve a God who is sinless. You also need to know we serve a God who is not overcoming, but he's already overcome. And he needed these disciples to get get a glimpse of who he was. Yes, he was a man, but he was also God in flesh. And sometimes they got so captivated with the flesh that they forgot that he was God. But you know the beauty about having Jesus in your life? You have victory over sin. One of the saddest things I'm finding in the church is to have people who think they are found, but they really are lost. People who think they have a clear picture of who God is, but what they really don't realize is they're not living from a mindset of victory. They're living from a mindset of defeat. And they don't have a clear picture of who God is because maybe there's some areas and attributes of their life that haven't been fully surrendered to God. Why do we need to see the beauty of the sinlessness of who God is? Because something happens at salvation, students. When you say yes to Jesus, he changes your nature. But this Bible also tells us we don't live by flesh and blood, but powers and principalities. 
in realms that we, we can't see. And because of that, we have an enemy who does not like us. Everyone look at your neighbor and say this, the devil is a hater. And look at that other person you tried to avoid the first time and say the devil is a hater. Why do I say the devil is a hater? Because all the way in Genesis, the only thing in creation that was made in the image of God was you and I. Men. Mankind. And so when the devil sees us, he just sees his old boss and he's reminded of what happened to him. And because of that, he's trying to tear apart your mind. He's trying to tear apart your body. He's trying to tear apart your thought life. But there's times in the midst of temptation that even when it feels too difficult to overcome, that you need to remember when you call on this name Jesus, that's not just a get out of jail free card. That's the answer. The conquering answer to any form of temptation you can face. The glory of his sinlessness. There's another component I want to look at. I want to go in the verse number five, if we can, this morning. It goes on to say, Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorial, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this uh, because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from a cloud said, this is my Dearly loved son, listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone. And all they saw was Jesus with them. We saw the glory of his sinlessness, but we also need to see the glory of God's sonship. Jesus is not God's second best option. Jesus is God. Y'all want to do this in John? In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was Jesus was there in the beginning. The danger with this is too many Christians live their their life like Jesus started in a manger in Bethlehem. And when we call on the name of Jesus, we don't really call on him in confidence. It's like, well, you know, no, 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 no. Let me tell you something, friends. The whole book is about Jesus. In the Old Testament, he's concealed. In the New Testament, he's revealed. The entirety of it is about Jesus. He was there in the beginning. You know why I get excited when I say the name Jesus, when I think about this cross? Because I'm not talking about a Savior who just started this job. I'm talking about a Savior who spoke this earth into motion. So, therefore, any problem that I'm facing, any challenge that I'm facing, I don't have to even worry about that. Because, watch this, if he is the creator, he also created evil. Think about it. The glory of his sonship. And I love this because we see my dear friend here, one of my favorite disciples, Peter. My God, I love him. Constantly got his foot in his mouth. Jesus, let's make a shelter. No, Peter, no. No. Peter was like many of us. Peter was hanging on a moment. He was hanging on a moment. And sometimes the only thing about hanging on a moment is you're constantly waiting on the same feeling to reoccur over and over and over and over again. And when it doesn't reoccur, you find yourself defeated. You find yourself discouraged. Well, chapel didn't feel the same way it was. And the song didn't. Uh, you know. But a voice resounded from heaven. He said, this is my son. Listen to him. Because what was God saying to Peter? The presence of God that was shown right there is not a presence that's going to be stagnant to one place. The presence of God that was exemplified in that place is a presence that goes with you. You don't need to build a shelter or an idol for something that's constantly moving. And when Jesus transfigured that day, it says Moses and Elijah were shown in him. This gives me more confidence about Jesus. 
Moses represents the law. Elijah represents Old Testament prophecy. So when we say the name Jesus, we're saying the name of the one who abolished the law and the one who fulfilled prophecy. I'm saying this because I remember being here as a student, and I remember feeling some type of way because Brother Jones used to wake us up real early and come to prayer class. Y'all still do that? Man, these kids are blessed. <laughs> 6 a.m. in the morning with Dr. David Jones. We would walk in here, and we would hear him saying, Oh, God. Crying on his own, oh, God. And I never understood that. and I, It didn't make any sense to me, and I used to be mad that we were having to get up out of our dorm room, second semester, it's freezing, to come and pray, and I never understood that. And all he said to me was this, and it changed my life. He said, listen, I don't get up here to pray and say a lot of lofty words. When I get up here, I call in the name of Jesus because he's the all-encompassing one. That's it? He's the fulfillment of the law. He is sinless. I want to look at a few more verses here. And the Bible says this, as they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves. But they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. Then they asked him, why do teachers of the law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? So we have the glory of his sinlessness. We have the glory of his sonship. But we also have the glory of his suffering. The glory of his suffering brought, apart, brought upon some finality. Meaning that Take heart. Jesus has already overcome the world. It meant, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you should fear no evil. It meant that, yes, he died. But on that third day, he did get up. And him getting up gives us the foundation of why we do what we do, hope, hope, hope. I make an emphasis on seeing who Jesus is because one of the number one things that I get asked to talk about and we shared a little bit about it yesterday is identity, identity. And so often we, we look for identity. Who am I? What am I supposed to do? But where does the search for identity start? Genesis. Genesis. But what's keeping a generation from understanding their identity? They haven't had a clear picture of who Jesus is. The most beautiful thing about the Garden of Eden is this. You only had one choice to make. You know what I want to do when I get to heaven? Yo, Adam, you have one choice to make, bro. One. One. You know the challenge we like today? We got too many choices to make. One choice. That was the beauty of it. But it was in that moment that when man chose his own form of righteousness, when man chose to eat off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was the moment that simultaneously we turned our face from Jesus, and ever since we've been trying to return. One of the most difficult things I have to do now in ministry is walk with people uh, through hardships. I walk with people through... Um, dying hours, to walk with people through 
uh, chaotic situations. And I remember as a young minister and a young pastor seeing this and just feeling hopeless and defeated. Wanting to fix it, but wanting to know the right word to say, but not being able to say it. And two years ago, when, when God messed me up, as we were, you were hearing about today, it was in those moments that I just helped people get a simple glimpse of who Jesus is. Why? He's the all-encompassing one. You know what I love about the New Testament? Everything can be handled in the name of Jesus. Why is it important for a generation to understand that? In the name of Jesus, demonic forces have to flee. In the name of Jesus, sick bodies have to be healed. In the name of Jesus, fear has to cease. In the name of Jesus, anxious thoughts have to halt. In the name of Jesus. But oftentimes I feel, I feel like Peter, y'all. I feel like I'm just hanging on so tight to a moment that I've missed his movement. But here's my plea to a generation this morning. As, 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 as we get in preparation for tonight. We need to get back to this place where we cry out, not for anything, not because we, 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 we want something, but simply because we want to see Jesus. Why? I got sin in my life. I need to see him. I've got areas of my life I can't fix. I try to fix them. Doesn't work. I need to see him. I need to see him. My faith is growing dim. I got a lot of semester left and a little bit of money. I don't know how I'm going to make it. I need to know that he is God and if it, that he's still for me. I need to see him. I need to see him because I know what suffering is. and I know what hard times is. But I also need to know that he still is the blessed hope. I need to see Jesus. So here's what I wanted to do this morning. I want to keep it very simple. I'm going to call the worship team back. And I want us to sing that, uh, that last song that we just sung. Tonight will be more of me preaching. This morning will be more of you responding. For some of us, Jesus has been something we've read about. Jesus has been something we've heard about, we've studied about. But the question we have to ask ourselves today, has Jesus become real to us? Has he transfigured for us? Do we really get that we have victory over sin? Watch this, that we have victory over sin. Do we really get the potency of who he is, being God in the flesh. Do we really get it? Do we really get the fact that though, 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 though he suffered, and though we may suffer, it's not the end of the story. I left with a lot of things at Trinity Bible College. One being dead. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> Not really. Shout out to Mandy. <clears throat> and as I've been on campus, I've been thinking, students, about all that God has done in my life. And 
all these moments in this chapel and all the places I've gone and the things I've been able to do, the best thing I left with was a foundation of who Jesus is. Why? Because the storms do come. It does get hard. Sometimes your reality over, overwhelms your revelation. But God, you told me you, that you called me to the missions field and I don't see any money. Take hope. And it's in those moments that when Jesus becomes real, the entirety of the situation changes. Even if not outwardly, intrinsically. Watch this. Because sometimes Jesus doesn't have to switch your position if he can switch your perspective. But Jesus isn't the second option. His story didn't start in the New Testament. He's not just meandering around. No, he's God himself. And because of that, when I call on that name, things begin to change. I'm going to stand to our feet. Two months ago, I found out <coughs> that my godmother, my aunt, uh, she had cancer, but the cancer spread to her brain. She has stage four brain cancer. Uh, this lady raised me, and, you know, uh, just another second mother to me. It's hard to watch somebody you love suffer. <laughs> but I called her, and she said, yeah. She said, but you know, God is good. How? She said, because Lord knows if I didn't have this cancer, I wouldn't be able to witness to these nurses. What? Perspective. Why? She's seen Jesus. I break it down like this. Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. I've seen him. So even though my body's failing, I can still have joy because joy is not situational. Joy is eternal. Stage four cancer, and she's thanking God that, she had, she, that she's there so she has the opportunity to witness to the nurses and the doctors. What is the glory of God? It's the beauty of God in any and all situations. And as we sing this song this morning, students, I want to give us at least about five minutes to respond. And this is not about uh, 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 me, you, know, you coming to the altar and me, me laying my hands on you. This is about you having this moment with God and saying, I need you to be real to me. I need you. I need you to be real to me. Because that's the only way I can live my life for your glory. Because oftentimes in my life, Jesus, I can be real with you. It don't look good but I still need to know that you're good. I need a glimpse of who you are. So as we sing this song, this is between you and him. Maybe you need to spread out. Maybe you need to come to this altar. Maybe you need to sit down and reflect. I don't know the situation you're going through. I don't know the circumstances on your mind. I don't know the person that's on your mind. My challenge to you is we're going to spend five minutes and we're going to call on the name. And I believe something is going to shift in this place. Y'all with me this morning? Can we do that? Can we do that this morning? Somebody, can we do that real quick? Y'all cool with having an encounter with God this morning? God forbid if he shows up. Y'all cool with that this morning? Let's extend those hands to heaven. Come on, worship team. Lead us. Thank you for listening to the Trinity Bible College and Graduate School Chapel Podcast. If you are wanting some more in-depth discussion with some fantastic leaders, be sure to check out the Trinity Bible College Leadership Podcast. We hope that this podcast has inspired, uplifted, and encouraged you. You can find us on the web at www.trinitybiblecollege.edu.